I want to finish tonight the perfection of God. This is part three. This is taken from the book, The God You Can Know, by Dan DeHaan. And um, let me just quickly give you the things that we have done so far over the last two weeks without teaching it, just saying it by the words. Uh, we're talking about God's uh, Im immutability is, per is perfect. That means he's unchanging. His omnipotence is is perfect. That means he's all powerful. His omniscience is perfect. That means he's all knowing. Uh, his omnipresent is per presence is perfect. That means God is everywhere all at once. His goodness is perfect. His holiness is perfect. And then on the second week, we talked about his knowledge. His foreknowledge is perfect. Also, his sovereignty is perfect. His wisdom is perfect. His loving kindness is perfect. His patience is perfect. And then tonight we want to jump in and we'll conclude this. Uh, only have uh, just a few tonight to cover and we'll be done with this. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the anointing of your word. God, we're just learning about who you are just to help us to, under, to kind of grasp the knowledge that you are still perfect. The world, God, is in a, in a mess, and everything seems to be going crazy, but, God, you are still perfect. So we put our faith, our trust, our hope, our confidence in you. I pray, God, that you'd give me the anointing that I need to be able to teach tonight. I pray, God, that you'd give us understanding, give us a, a revelation power. Help us to catch a rhema word tonight in Jesus' name, and everybody said. So tonight we start with his mercy. The Bible says his mercy endures forever. Psalms 145 verse 9 says his mercies are all over his works. They're over all of his works. So mercy doesn't deal with just us. God's mercy is connected to anything he's done. God's mercy is connected to anything he's created, to whether it's uh, people, whether it's the animals, whether it's the planet. No, no matter what it is, God is merciful. God in all his perfection has decided to have mercy. Now, let me give you a, a somewhat easy definition of mercy. Mercy means compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. In other words, God has the ability to strike us down, but instead he has mercy. He shows restraint when a lot of times he, pro I don't know if he ever because of which I will get to in a minute, how much he loves us. I don't know if he ever wants to strike us down because he wants us to be healed. He wants us to be redeemed. He wants us to be restored. But because his mercy is perfect, we need to understand that it never dries up, it never runs out, and that he wants to show that he has all the ability to cause us to disappear. He has all of the ability to cause us to just swivel up and die on the spot. But he has so much mercy that he's willing to give us another day Another chance and another chance and another day, three, four, five years from now, because he's merciful. What happens, though, in the church world way too often is that people begin to get into a situation where they get active in church, they get active in, in the word, they get active in God, and before long they become self-sufficient. And they believe they, they no longer rely on God's mercy and they become a little self-righteous. And they believe, oh, I can do it all on my own. I, I, I don't really, oh, I, I, don't, I don't fear God anymore. I, I don't have to, I, I, I'm okay. I, I'm good enough on my own. I'm righteous enough on my own. And before long, they move themselves into a position where now they're in danger of his judgment instead of his mercy because they are depending on themselves instead of depending on who God is. We will never be good enough to not need mercy. Me at my very, very best. Me after 40 hours of Bible study in one day. <laughs> I mean, living in a, in a cave with a long beard and a rusty robe on. Listen, even then, I still have to have God's mercy because I will never in my flesh be good enough without his mercy. Amen. 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24 says, And David said to Gad, I am in deep distress. Listen to what he says. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. 
but do not let me fall into human hands. You've got to get to a place to where you trust the mercy of God more than you trust anything else. And when you're in a season of trouble, whether it's a season of sin, whether it's a season of, of, of separation uh, or season of rebellion, you still need to say, God, I'm going to trust your mercy. I'd rather fall in the hands of a merciful God than in the hands of my enemy. I'd rather trust even God. I am dirty. I've messed up. I've backslidden. But I know your mercy is great. So I'm going to fall into your hands because I know, God, you will have compassion through your mercy. Psalms 86 verse 5 says, yes, you, Lord, are forgiving and good. You are abounding in love to all who call upon you. Ephesians 2 verse 4, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, his mercy will never run out. His mercy is perfect. Now we always talk about mercy and grace together. So let's segue right into grace. Grace is perfect. God's grace is is perfect. Now, where mercy extends to all things, all of God's works, grace is exclusive just to us. Grace is just for us. Burkhoff, in his systematic theology, defines grace this way. The unmerited goodness or love of God to those who have forfeited it and are by nature under a sentence of condemnation. We forfeited it, but God's grace is given to us. It's unmerited. It's unwarranted. God's love is given to us even though we have allowed ourselves to fall in under the sentence of condemnation. God has grace. And grace is always unmerited. But now here's the thing about grace. Grace requires a broken spirit to recognize it for what it is. If you're going to operate in grace, you have to have a broken spirit. And you have to say, God, I need you. God, I've got to have your grace. Pride will push grace away. A humble spirit will cause grace to rush in. Grace and works will never unite, just like oil and water. If it is by grace, it is no longer the basis of work. Because if it's otherwise based on work then grace is no longer needed. And we have to remember Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace. Justified means I'm declared perfect before God. It is grace, not my works. As I said, no matter how good enough I am, I will never be good enough not to need mercy. But no matter how much I work, I will still need grace because I will never be able to work myself enough to be able to give me what God's grace gives me. I will never be able to earn with all of my work what God's grace gives me freely. Thank God for his grace. I don't play any part in the help in my justification. It all comes through grace. Now listen, I want you to think about this. I'm standing in the courtroom. I'm standing there guilty as mud. You know, I mean, I deserve to go to hell. I deserve to be in jail. And I don't have anything to say that's going to help my justification. And out of nowhere comes Jesus. And because of his grace, he looks at me and goes, hey, I don't even see sin in you because of his grace. I'm no longer guilty. And the judge says, man, you can go free because I don't see any sin in you. Isn't grace amazing? And I, and I didn't do anything to deserve that except for a merciful God who is perfect and a God that's grace is perfect. And no matter how big my sin, in, sin is, no matter how awful my sin is, God still is able to allow grace to remove it. Grace demands a walk of humble devotion. Because when you get grace, and let me read you this sentence or this question straight from the book. Can you know grace and walk without concern for God? Can you know grace and walk without concern for God? In other words, don't you realize what God has done for you through grace? Don't you realize we deserve to be in hell? We deserve to be bound. We deserve to be broken, but out of grace. In other words, I had such a high price tag on my head, it cost me 
a man's life out of that obligation to a man who died for me should not be worshiping God serving God should not be doing all I can after all he gave his life his grace has pardoned my sins and I ought to do everything I can to worship him I ought to do everything I can to serve him I ought to do everything I can to shine the light because his grace I will never be able to repay grace but man I ought to be grateful enough to recognize grace and recognize the work. Romans chapter 6 verse 1 says, Do we continue in sin that grace might increase? Oh no, God forbid. But grace is always there. When, when I read this book, when I read this sentence in the book, I questioned it. So you may question it as well. By receiving grace, grace is perfect, right? There is no impurity in grace. Grace is perfect. By receiving God's grace, the perfect grace from the perfect God, by receiving God's grace, we are as pure as he is. Let that sink in for a second. Because I almost felt like a little sacrilege coming in my spirit when I read that. When, I, when grace is applied to my life, I am now as pure as God is. Think about that for a second. You may be thinking, I don't see how I can't never be as pure. Yes, here's why. Because, listen, grace doesn't just cover sin. We always think about our sin being covered. Our sin is not covered. Our sin is removed. Grace doesn't, if grace was a blank and Amy was full of sin, and God, God doesn't cover Amy and her sin is still there. God, the grace, the perfect grace of God takes all of that sin and removes it as far as the east is from the west. Now, therefore, she is just as pure as God is because God has taken her sin. What a perfect God. We should never have to have cheerleaders trying to get people to pump up to worship a God of grace. We should never have a dead church service in a living church because we ought to recognize we are all recipients of God's perfect grace and I stand as pure as God is. Now watch this because if I'm not as pure as God is, I can't go to heaven. Because there is no any type of unholiness in heaven. So if God doesn't make me as pure as he is, I don't get to get in. But because of the perfect grace, I have access not only to walk through the gates of pearls down the throne, I can walk right up to the feet of Jesus, bow at his feet, and worship him for all eternity. That is perfect grace. Thank God by grace I am saved. The price tag on my life is too great for me to shug or just shake off wrongdoing. Listen, oh, it don't matter if I do this. What? Grace? The price of grace? What do you mean it doesn't matter if you do this? God loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son so that you could be a recipient of grace. What does it mean it doesn't matter if you say that? or do that, or go there. It matters because Jesus gave his life so that you could be saved. His mercy is perfect. His grace is perfect. His love is perfect. As we near the, the end of this conversation on the perfection of God, we must not leave behind the love of God. God not only gives us love, he is love itself. His love is not just another characteristic that we find among men. His love is the very nature of who he is. There is no condition put on God's love. He doesn't love us if we love him. He doesn't love us because we love him. He doesn't have a love that is turned off to punish us. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. His love is spontaneous. His love is not fickle. He doesn't say, I'm going to teach Danny a lesson. I'm not going to let her have none of my love today. Now, that's not what God does. His love is too perfect because God is love. He can't hold love from you because that's who he is. And we learn that he's everywhere. So everywhere he is, there he is, there is love. I can bask in his love no matter what situation I'm in, no matter what battle I'm going through, in the middle of my darkness, in the middle of my depression, in the middle of my hurt, in the middle of my anger. God is there, and if God is there, his love is there because God is love. Oh, what a perfect love. His love is eternal. 
His love is enduring. Even a child can comprehend. Let me read you what Robert McCann said. He said, some of you, see if this applies to you. Some of you are longing to be able to love God. Then come into his love. Consent to be loved by him, though you're worthless in yourself. It is better to be loved by him than to love, and it's, only, and it's the only way to learn to love him. When the light of the sun falls upon the moon, it finds the moon dark and unlovely. But the moon reflects the light and casts it back again. So let the love of God shine into your breast, and you will cast it back again. The love of Christ constraineth us. We love him because he first loved us us. The only cure for a cold heart is to look at the heart of Jesus. Oh, I just want to love him more. Then get into his love more. Because the only you're never going to learn enough to love him the way he loves you. So just bask in his love. And the more you're around him, the more you'll love him. You don't have to be a 90-day fiancé. I think that's the name of some show. I, we never watched, by the way, we have never watched that show. But I think it follows Sister Wise, which we do watch. And, uh, uh, and, and you don't have to try to figure out in the 90 days if you're going to marry this stranger that has a different accent and lives a different lifestyle than you. No, no, no. God is love. Get into him so you can. And watch this. Not only when you get into law, God's love will you love him more, that love will begin to shine into others. And you'll love people. And you're like, why am I not mad with this person? Why am I feeling compassion? Why, why am I wanting to help this person? Why am I wanting to minister to this person? Why am I wanting to give to this person? Here's why. Because you've been with God long enough for his love to begin to affect the way you live. Get into his love. If you feel like biting everybody's head off like a bat, like who was that man on? Was it Kiss that ate bat heads and spit out the blood? Oh, I was, oh no, how y'all supposed to know that? I thought y'all were holy. Lord, help half the church started saying Ozzy Osbourne. Y'all better not listen to that stuff. That was bad stuff. Good grief. I didn't know. My wife says, everybody knows it. I didn't know it. Thank you, Sister Sandra. God's grace has been perfect in our lives. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> so, I digress. I got lost in my own conversation. Oh, I know what I was going to say. So, if you feel like biting off bat's head and spitting out the blood, then you need to get into God's love. Because if you're having hateful spirits, hateful thoughts, and hateful aggravations, and you're, you're flowing in the vein of hate, all you got to do is run back into the love of God because God's love will wash that hate away. So anytime, listen, the best way to solve hate problems in the world is for the love of God to begin to penetrate the lives of the haters because somebody who's been penetrated by the love of God cannot hate. Amen. So how can you measure God's love? You just look to the cross. He shows you all of his love with his arms stretched out wide. Out of his great love, we ought to love others because he loves us, because he died for us. We ought to worship him, love him, and adore him. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his love toward us. And I, I love this. I love this passage of scripture. I don't have a favorite Bible verse. I know a lot of people say, What's your favorite Bible verse? I don't have one. There's two. How can you have a favorite when there's, what, what was it? Is it 3,000? I can't remember that one thing Bob Sorge kept on saying. 3,003 verses. Y'all remember? I mean, he said it like 16,000 times. How did we forget that from that workshop? Uh, but anyway, there's a bunch of verses to try to find a favorite one. But this would be close to my top. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In the midst of all my horrible sin, think about you at your worst. God looked down and said, I believe I'm going to die for that. That's love. And it wasn't because he saw you in your filth, but he saw what you could be outside of your filth. And isn't that how awesome God is? That's how great God is? That when he sees me in messed up, twisted up, addicted and bound, he says, oh, but I know what it's going to look like when they come through grace. I know what they're going to look like after I save them, redeem them, restore them. When my love covers them, when my grace is made sufficient for them, then I know what they're going to become. 
1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. This is how God showed us his love among us. He sent his son, his only son, into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He sent his son that we, and I, I don't have time to preach this because I told Amy we would get out early tonight. He sent his only son into the world that we might live. Everybody say live. live. Through him. Listen, God didn't call us to be dead. He called us to live. We must realize life comes through the perfection of God. Let us see that he's perfect. Let us live. I'm going to be teaching. I, I, I tried this out at a men's supper last night that I spoke at. Uh, on some points out of uh, Ezekiel, uh, and, and so I can't do it now, but I'll, I'll, I will in, 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 a, in a few weeks, because it does no good to have bones come back together if they don't live. So you're going to hear this point again, but you'll forget it by the time I do the lesson, because don't you know a lot of church people are so happy that the bones came back together and skin covered the bones, but they're not alive. Don't be content Jesus doesn't want bones to come together with sinews and flesh, but without, not without breath. He died so that we could live. 1 John 4, 8, whosoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So if you don't have love in your life, if you don't have, I'm, I'm going to let the word speak for itself. Whoever does not love does not know God. So if you do not have love, then you do not know God. You don't have God. In other words, not much how much you come to church. If you don't have a heart of love, you're not saved. If you are hating more people than you're loving, then you're not saved. That's not me. That's 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. You, you call King James and ask him about it. Don't be calling me. His love is perfect. Let me conclude this series with the last one. His wrath dun, 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 is perfect. We don't like talking about his wrath. But you cannot escape the attribute that his wrath is perfect. We feel like this doesn't belong in all the perfection of God. But aren't you thankful God knows how to judge his people? And remember, was it week one or week two that I talked about God is a God of mercy, but he's also a God of justice. And if you don't fall into his mercy, you will fall into his justice. If you don't repent and get forgiveness, he has to because he is the supreme authority. So he has to judge. And here's the thing you have to remember. He hates sin. He hates it. God's holiness would mean nothing if he did not hate sin. In other words, for God's holiness to be perfect, he has to despise sin. Because if he, if he allows sin, then he's not holy. So in order for us to, don't ever forget God hates sin. And wrath is holiness. Oh, this is, a, this is Dan DeHaan. This ain't Pastor Chris, but it's a great sentence. Wrath is holiness stirred into activity. Wrath is holiness stirred into activity. You have to understand because of his holiness, he will deal with sin. There will come a day when he will tell people, get away from me. I do not know you. You are a worker of iniquity. And they will be sent to a hell's fire that will never be quenched. And that's not a place reserved just for the devil. It's for those who do not put their faith in. In Jesus Christ, those who have sin in their life because you cannot have sin into heaven. The preachers of the past used to preach the wrath of God so hard that people realized they needed to repent. The old preachers of the past preached hellfire and brimstone, not to, well, maybe to scare people, but to give people the reality that God hates sin and there's a hell waiting for sinners. 
And now, and, and, and I guess I'm guilty of this too, we, ha we have been conditioned over the last 50, 60, 70, 100 years to be able to preach all these things that will make people feel uh, like they're growing and feel like, the, but we have forgotten that God hates sin and that we don't see the wrath of God as serious as it is. You cannot escape his wrath just because you're a good person. His, his grace is not perfect if he allows you to slip by. His wrath, his holiness, his goodness, his love is not perfect if he overlooks your sin. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 29 says, God is a consuming fire. True fear is needed in the hearts of God's children today. A fear so much that would keep us faithful to him. I know nobody's scared of mamas anymore, but some of us will grew up differently. And you feared your parents. My parents never told me the things not to do. I just knew not to do it. You know what I mean? I, my dad never told me, don't you come home with the earring. I just knew not to come home with an earring. Or I wouldn't have it. I don't know if he would have. I don't know if he'd have taken my ear off. I don't know what would have happened. I just knew not to do that. You know, I just, there are several things I knew not to do. Because of the fear you had, because of the discipline or the wrath of your parents, you didn't cross some borders because you knew not to do that. Will we ever get back to a place to where we fear the wrath of God so much we'll say, oh, I'm, I'm faithful. <laughs> no, God, I ain't, I ain't getting at this wheel. No, sir, I will not cross over here and walk on that side of the... No, sir, I'm going to live right because I'm so afraid of your wrath. I ain't going to be judged. I ain't going to hell. I ain't missing eternity. I ain't going to go to hell and miss out being with you for eternity. I ain't, no, God, I ain't doing it. Are we, do we recognize the perfection of God's wrath enough to where it will cause you to walk holy? Mm. Now, yes, of course, his love overcomes wrath a lot. But no man in his right mind wants to pit one against the other. God is angry with the wicked every day, says Psalms 11, Psalm 7, verse 11. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 says, Knowing the fear, King James says, Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuaded men. That's what the preachers of the old day used to do. Out of the fear of God's wrath, they were able to persuade men to believe. How can me talking ending this wonderful series on the wrath of God be comforting to us? Here's why. Because every day I can count on being moved toward obedience to God by knowing his authority and his wrath. It's helping me, not hurting me. God will never disregard sin. We as parents... And maybe I'll only speak for me and Amy because y'all might be a lot better parents than we are. We will look the other way a lot. Y'all ever look the other way? Act like we didn't see him do something bad. God doesn't look the other way. He's not going to disregard sin. He's not going to turn his back on it. We have a God who so delights in purity. He so hates sin that he has to deal with it through his wrath. Psalms 130, verse 3, If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? What does God's wrath mean to the unbeliever? The unbeliever should understand that the ungodly will not stand in the judgment. If our Lord cried out under God's wrath, think about Jesus crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What will the sinner do? If, if Jesus in his perfection, how be it carrying the weight of our sin, cried out in the agony, what will we do if we miss God? Let me read you some scripture and I'll close tonight. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppresses the truth, by their unrighteousness, they damn up truth. The wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness. 
We just don't preach about wrath much, do we? Ezekiel 25, 17, I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes. They will know that I'm the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. Nahum chapter 1, verse 2 through 6, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. I don't want to be an enemy. I want to be a child. Why would we, in the day we're living in, miss the perfection of mercy and grace and have to deal with wrath? The greatest thing about me is not anything other than I have walked through the perfect mercy and the perfect grace and I can escape the perfect wrath. I don't want to fall in the hands of an angry God. I want to know that God is for me and not against me. John chapter 15, verse 6 says, If a man abideth not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them. They cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Luke chapter 12, verse 5 says, But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after hath killed the power to cast into hell. Fear him. In other words, quit worrying about everybody else who has no power in the afterlife. You better fear the God of heaven who has the power to put you through his wrath and send you to hell. You better stand. I got, I'm five minutes early, Sister Amy. I told you it was going to be a short night. Short by five minutes. God is perfect. In all his ways, God is perfect. And I am just so thankful for his perfection. And I choose to be able to look at every one of those and go, God, you are my God. Thank you, God, for being my God. And I am pure tonight because of his perfect love, perfect mercy, perfect grace. Ah, God is awesome. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for all the attributes, God. Thank you even for wrath that causes me to act right because I don't want to fall into the hands of a God that is angry with me. So, Father, if there's anybody in this room that is going to face your wrath, let them meet your perfect love, grace, and mercy tonight. God, we don't have to fall into wrath when we can live in grace. We don't have to deal with the anger of God when I can deal with the love of God. So God, help us, convict us, draw us into your love. Let us experience that justification and that grace. God, you are perfect, and I love you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, between now and...